Gabori very much paints the places that are important to her. She doesn't paint her dreamy or the, the legends as much as she paints the landscape. She paints the fish traps, the places where turtles nest and food sources are found, the salt pans and the tidal flats. These are the places that she grew up knowing and they're the places that mean most to her and her people. On the small island, of Kudai, small island in which they grew up, the Kudayat developed a very detailed knowledge of every variation in their geography, the physical features, the flora and fauna, and the associated stories, both historical and legend, all of which are the subject for paintings. But among Gabori's favourite paintings are the story of Dubirdabi, the rock cod ancestor whose liver was thrown into the sea to create a perpetual fresh, freshwater s s um, well. Um, and Nick Evans, in writing about this, these subjects, says it's quite clear that the sense of the Burdaby country is biographical, the country belonging to the rock cod totem people in her life, her husband Pat and his father rather than mythological um, or ecological. So she is actually painting landscapes. She also placed, paints Thundi, uh, which is the beach, um, where the big river enters the sea. Gabori says, Thundi is my father's and grandfather's country on Bentig Island. It is a safe place to camp when there is bad weather. We can camp next to the big river that runs through it. She also paints um, the freshwater lagoon at Nianyulki, where we built the first outstation when my people returned to our country after being taken away. There is a big reef offshore and good fishing and hunting place. You can also see where the dugong have been eating seagrass on the bottom by the trail. They leave on the bottom. And the estuary at Maraki. This is where my big brother, King Alfred, was born on Bentic Island. It's a very big river that runs through it and a good place to catch a dugong and turtle when they come in with the high tide. And by catch, we mean actually wrestle with the dugong. Um, it must be an extraordinary experience. It's hard for us to imagine the hurt of being forcibly removed from your homeland, no longer able to work, walk over your own land to hunt to gather and to fish as you grew up doing and as your ancestors did for generations before. It really is unimaginable. How Gabori kept her story and her land alive in her mind's eye and memory can only be remarkable. The return visits which began in the 1980s when she was in her early 60s strengthened her experience and memories and her wish to tell the stories and to show us the places that she held dear. And we now see those, the result of that desire around us. Where does the painting come from? The Kadayat had no pictorial tradition of bark painting or sand painting. So somehow or other these pictures come from somewhere else. They're largely uninfluenced by other artists on Mornington Island. Um, and they have no knowledge of Western painting. De Gabori has developed a unique way in which to cope with her and to show us and to tell the stories of her life. Both May Budnadufi and Paula Paul's work is considered to be informed by the Kadayat practice of ritual scarification, building up a pattern of scars on the skin uh, to mark initiation, deaths, various stages of life. But the ease with which this is translated into painting is something of a puzzle. However, Paul Mehmet has noted that there's an ethnographic record of Kadayat elders painting themselves for ritual dances to enact increased ceremonies, ceremonies which are going to ensure that there are lots of fish. Soon after their arrival on Mornington Island in the late 1940s, there was a male initiation ceremony, the last of these authentic uh, preparations 
uh, must have been uh, particularly important to the people. And it was observed by men and women. The Kadayat, being such a small group, didn't practice um, separation. Men and women, young and old, were involved in important ceremonies and performed and prepared for them. Everybody was involved. And most likely, Gubori, as a uh, young woman married, would have been one of the people that would have helped prepare for this ceremony. In Gabori's work, the surface has an extraordinary sensual quality. Um, smeared and dabbed, I think, of the painter's being very often. There's distinct similarities with how the paint is put on the canvas and with how you might smear ochre onto a body. And I think this is the clue to where the work comes from to some extent. However, these gentle, smeared and dabbed brush strokes seem to feel the surface of the canvas and the loved landscape she's conjuring up in her mind's eye. They're also accompanied by some extraordinarily energetic and strong brush strokes. Remember, this is somebody who's not being taught to hold a brush, who's suddenly been given a brush and the canvas is flat in front of her. And so she's pushing the paint around in a most unconventional way in terms of Western painting. She's smearing the paint with the brush and she's dabbing the paint with the brush. Um, the, the energy with which she paints, these very strong brush strokes, are undoubtedly um, speak of her desire to get things down quickly, to capture a memory and to tell her story in the strongest possible way. If you're in your 80s and you've just started to tell your story, you want to work fairly quickly. She often paints paint over paint and paint into paint. And pictures are usually painted at a single session. So you can imagine the energy going into painting these big pictures. Um, but in painting paint into paint, of course, she's getting colours coming through wet paint. Uh, as you see, especially in the pale paintings, the pictures that I think of as the ice cream paintings, like this one here, um, it's just like gelato, but you see her working the white over the top of the colour, bringing the colour through, letting it bleed, bleed through. The effect is um, a sort of amorphous, soft, gentle um, imagery. It gives you the feeling of salt pans and mirage and shimmering heat and of water rip, shimmering on the sea, or a fish breaking through um, a still surface. These pictures depict the salt pans and the fish traps, and sometimes there are clearly defined edges that do conjure up some of the uh, great fish traps built around the island. And if you Google Bentig Island and see the fish traps, uh, which come up in a good image, it is extraordinary to see these great big fish traps built out into the sea. Um, at the, you know, there are pictures which are distinguished by this extraordinarily energetically applied area of clear colour, the picture in the big picture in the room there. Um, they are unexpected contrasts of colour. Um, and these are the pictures that show her haste to get her story down more than anything else. Uh, they're big and bold. Um, but she also paints paintings which are dark, like the painting here. Um, storms and bruised skies and dark seas and brilliantly lit um, horizon lines, as you see in tropical um, storms. Uh, she has an ability to um, conjure up nature, to, to paint nature and the power of nature. I hesitate to use those Western terms, like the sublime. It's not something she knows about, but she does know about the power of nature. I don't use the term abstract expressionist paintings. I don't use the term expressionist painting when I'm looking at these works, because it seems wrong. It doesn't seem right. And yet, they certainly are great landscapes and great expressionist painting in terms of how they're produced. Um, they belong to a tradition of art 
where the artist's brush mark is the most powerful, the most individual um, mark that the artist can make. It's like a signature. It belongs to um, that tradition of people like, most easily, Jackson Pollock or Motherwell's brilliant, splashy marks. But go back a little bit longer and look at Monet's water lily pictures where the flickering brush strokes built up over years in many instances um, are such an expression of not just capturing the light but an expression of the individual. And you can even take it back to the late paintings of Turner. It's an extraordinary example of uh, in the National Gallery of Victoria, Valdosta, where the surface of the picture is just white smudges, um, where he's trying to capture uh, the, the landscape, fog, mist, snow, whatever, uh, but is actually presenting you with the most amazing um, personal expression with his brush strokes, just like his handwriting all over the surface of the picture. So what do I find about Gabori's paintings that is so beautiful? Why do I describe them to myself? Why do I think of them as being beautiful? The title suggests subjects which are obviously of great significance to her, but they have no bearing on my enjoyment of the paintings. They're not repetitious. They're not the reworkings of a traditional subject, which helps my appreciation because that is what I value in contemporary Western art. But these are not the most important reasons. Undoubtedly for me, Sally Gabori's uninhibited use of colour is exciting. It possesses extraordinary energy. And then there is the sensual touch of the ice cream paintings, this very gentle touch. And there are the dark brooding works that evoke the strength of nature and Gabori's respect for its powers. When looking at her paintings, each time they offer something more, something I had not seen before. They're paintings of enormous sophistication and subtle complexity. But most importantly, these are paintings of extraordinary commitment. Every sensual brush stroke, those strong strokes literally pushing paint onto and across the canvas, the smears and the dabs, this feeling of the landscape in her mind's eye, this putting it down, um, express her, her heartfelt love for her country. And I think that is what makes them so extraordinarily beautiful. Thank you.